I want uh, all of you guys, and again, those of you who are streaming our service and listening by radio, to go ahead and get your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Do you remember last week in my um, sermon that I said sin always takes you farther than you ever wanted to go? Well, we've already um, seen that happen, haven't we, in the book of Genesis? From eating a forbidden fruit, to hiding from God, to making excuses, and now in this chapter, to jealousy and murder, how much the sin and decline of the world has spread, even in the span of less than a chapter. And so uh, we're going to be looking at continued at that spread of sin, just that axiom that sin always takes you farther than you ever wanted to go. The title of the message for this morning is uh, The Stain of Sin, and our sermon text is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Now everybody knows what a stain is. It's the permanent residue of dirt and grime. A stain is hard to get rid of. And the word stain usually has a negative connotation. Stains are generally thought of as being undesirable, ugly, stubborn, and hard to get rid of. The word stain also has a permanent connotation. The stain of sin, though, is the ugliest and most stubborn stain of all. Now, if you remember the context of Genesis 4, is that the world has been infected by the sin and rebellion and unfaithfulness of Adam and Eve. And now in Genesis 4, we see that this stubborn stain of sin continues to deface mankind, and mankind is growing uglier and uglier. So let's go through this passage verse by verse, and let's learn more about the stain of sin and how you can get rid of that stain in your life. The first thing I want you to notice is in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 4, and it's this, stains have an environment. You know, if you play on the grass, uh, you're going to get stained green stains. If you, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you cut yourself while you're cutting celery in the kitchen, you're going to get a red, a blood stain. Sin and stains have an environment. The Bible says Adam and Eve knew, he knew his wife. They conceived and bore Cain. And he said, I've acquired a man from the Lord then she bore another child, and this time his name was Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And that's the environment where we see this stain of sin happen. Play in the grass, you'll see green stains. Eat in a cherry pie eating contest, and you'll see red stains. Stains you bear give testimony of the environment that you've been playing in. Cain and Abel were born into the environment of a sinful fallen world. And this world ultimately stained and disfigured their lives just as it had their parents, Adam and Eve. And you've been born into the environment of a sinful fallen world. You've been stained by sin. In fact, the Bible says that because of the perverted environment of this world that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And you all here today, you're doubly sinners. First by nature, almost genetically, we're humans because our parents were humans, almost genetically we are, we are, we are conceived in sin, we are born into sin, our nature is sin, our makeup is sin. And then second, by choice. Once you get old enough to choose, you choose to go your own way instead of God's way, living the self-life instead of living for God. Stains have an environment. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is that also stains have a source. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 into the beginning of verse 5. It says this, And in the process of time... It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. In verse 4, Abel also brought of the first fruit of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, 
but he did not look with favor upon Cain and his offering. So out of this environment of sin grew this situation that became a source of this ugly sinful stain of sin and um, now why did God respect one offering over uh, the other we don't really know why but we do know this according to you know Hebrews um, chapter 11 verse 4 without the shedding of blood there is no there is no forgiveness of sin and the Bible says that by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain Maybe it was just God's sovereign choice to accept that offering. Maybe it was because Cain's sacrifice was a non-blood sacrifice. It was an offering of human works. Hey, look at the great farming work that I've done. Um, that resembled more of the fig leaves that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with than with the animal skins that God covered for them. Or maybe, maybe it's because Abel, the Bible says, offered the first fruits of his, of his harvest and the fat and the greatest portions of that sacrifice but it does not say that Cain gave his best but whatever the reason we know that God's decision did not sit well with Cain leading to jealousy and envy and uh, and uh, so God warns him and this leads us to our next our next point stains have a warning look at um, verses 5 and 7 Cain was very angry that God didn't really look with as much favor on his offering as Abel's offering. Cain was angry. His countenance fell. In verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And, and, um, and uh, so God is saying, look, if you handle this the right way, if you handle this the right way, just like our upward kids, you know, some of them win their games on Saturday, some of them lose. But, but the big point is, if they handle it the right way, their character grows. And, um, and, and God says, look, you need to handle this the right way, because if you don't, sin is crouching at the door. Just like God warned Adam and Eve that they would die if they ate the forbidden fruit. And now here we see God warning Cain about his anger and jealousy and envy using the riveting phrase, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Just get that image in your mind because, folks, sin is always crouching at, at the door. Susan doesn't even know this, but I got bit by a dog yesterday. I got bit by a dog yesterday. I just remembered this. I was walking around um, the uh, Hunter's Creek, some of those golf trails, and, um, and this uh, dog was on the porch, and I'm walking up, and the dog just kind of sits up, and it's this chocolate lab. And, um, and so then it starts kind of, and I've, and I've passed this dog before. And, um, and so it comes up, and, you know, dogs are very territorial. It would come up to the, to the very edge of that little trail and ruff, ruff, ruff. You know, the last few days, I've kind of felt its breath on my legs, ruff, 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 you know. But, and um, so I'm walking along, and the dog comes up, ruff, 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 and I'm walking past it, and chomp, it bits me on the back of my, it bits me on the back of my. See, see, just like that, sin is crouching at the door. Some of you, it's getting closer. You've even felt its breath, but... If you don't watch out, chomp, all right, chomp. And, uh, and so sins, stains have a warning. God's saying, look, sin is crouching at the door. Just get that image in your mind, you know. There, there's, a, there's this plant, different varieties of plant called sundew plants. How many of you have heard of the sundew plant? It's a really interesting carnivorous plant. It grows on every continent of the world except Antarctica. And, um, and this, this plant eats insects, kids. Just imagine that. This plant eats insects. And the way they do it is through this beautiful, colorful flower. And everything in this flower says, hey, I'm full of nectar. Come and get it. And, um, and, and it also has this sweet sticky nectar all over all of the all of the little parts of that all of the petals of that flower all this dripping sweet nectar and i'm sure uh, i'm sure an insect sees that sundew plant and says oh man i've hit the jackpot man 
The color of that flower attracts me and that's, that, that nectar, that, that syrup is so sweet. And so, and so the insect decides to land and take a taste. And guess what I saw? I saw a PBS special on the sundew plant. And guess what? It lands and, man, it says I've hit the jackpot. Boy, this nectar is so great. And guess what? It gets stuck. And it starts, and it starts struggling. And then guess what? That, that, um, that stimulates the flower. And the flower begins to close in on that poor, that, on that poor insect. And, and then the PBS special said, guess what? The very nectar that attracted the insect is the digestive fluid that ends up taking its life and dissolving it. And you know, sin is like that. Oh, from the outside, it looks so colorful and it looks so sweet and it looks so spicy and it looks so attractive. And then you land just to take a taste and then you get stuck and you get digested by the, 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 the evil, fatal uh, characteristics of sin. Sin is crouching at the door, folks. And God warns us insects not to fall prey to that beautiful color, that color of anger, or that sweet color or taste of revenge. It will trap you. It will kill you. It will dissolve you. Sin is crouching at the door. And then fourthly, sins have a variety. Oh, the variety of sin. Thousands of ways for you to sin. I mean, thousands of ways. You put a person in a padded room and they can think of a thousand things to do wrong. The wide variety of sins, though, are just a symptom of the real disease called sin. Just like all the measles on your life, on your own your, on body, is a, really a symptom of a disease called measles. And all these varieties of sins is just a symptom of a disease called sin. And the variety of sins evolve and change, growing more serious and toxic and fatal. Reading in verse 8. Now, Cain's jealous, he's he's envious, his countenance has fallen. Verse 8, now Cain talked with with his brother Abel. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. In verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? We, we, We could have predicted it. They ate a forbidden fruit. It grew into hiding from God, making excuses, jealousy, envy, blaming others, rage, and now ultimately murder. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. Now, next, we need to realize that the stain of sin has a consequence. You touch a hot stove, you're going to burn your hand. Sin is the same way you touch it, you're going to get burned. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, we read as God says to Cain in verse 10, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you, a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth you know the bible reiterates that in the new testament in the book of romans chapter 6 verse 23 as it says the wages of sin is death in other words sin has a payment and it's death death came into the world in the last chapter chapter 3 of genesis when adam and eve sinned and then death and murder now continue to come into the world and 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 um and just and just are spread across the world when cain murdered his brother abel and now god tells cain of his consequences in killing his brother you're cursed from the earth and we're all still under the curse of sin today what will we do not only does the stain of sin have a consequence the stain you know stains also have a stubbornness stains also have a stubbornness in the next two verses verses 13 through 14 Cain says to the Lord my punishment is greater than I can bear surely you have driven me out from this day from the face of the earth I shall be hidden from your face I shall be a fugitive and a bag vagabond on the earth and And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. 
And so Cain is realizing that, that sin he can't, he can't get rid of, just like the, just like the, the play uh, Macbeth when, when one of the characters creates a murder and, and he has this imaginary spot on his hand and he keeps in, and he keeps in Shakespeare, and I hope, you do, I hope you forgive this language, he keeps saying, out damn spot, out damn spot. And, and so, so Cain has now been infected by this sin and it's stubborn. And he says, wherever I go, I'm marked by this stubborn stain of sin. And then finally, go, though, this uh, passage of Scripture kind of has a surprise ending because, praise God, sin has a remedy. And stains, the stain of sin has a remedy. The Lord says to him, in verse 15, hey, I'll, I'll mark you. You're marked by sin, but also you'll be marked by me. And whoever kills Sain, Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And th the Lord sets his mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So you see here, the remedy of sin is the Lord himself. Listen to that. The remedy of sin is the Lord himself. Even though Cain had sinned grievously, the Lord marked him as his own. Now, um, I don't know whether there are any murderers here or whether there are any murderers listening by, um, by uh, radio or streaming this service, but folks, if God can forgive this, he certainly stands ready to forgive you and cover you and mark you and save you. The remedy of the stain of sin in this passage of Scripture was God himself. The Lord marked him as his own. No one would extract vengeance upon Cain. It's God's uh, place uh, to, to extract uh, vengeance. Was Cain saved? Did he ever repent? Did God ever lift his curse? In the case of Cain, we do not know. But in your case, you can know. You can have the stain of sin lifted from your life. And you can know that you're saved because Jesus Christ promised you that he would save you if you will but call upon him and look to him to be saved. There is, uh, there, there's no doubt about it. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know who Jesus is? He's God incarnate. That's the Christmas story. That God loved the world so much that he came in the form of Jesus Christ. If you look to him, you can be saved. The only remedy for sin is looking to Jesus Christ. The only way to cleanse that stain, that spot from your life is to look to Jesus Christ. That famous old hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, says it this way. One of the verses, it says, Dark is the stain that I cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide whiter than snow. You can be today. And I love that word in that verse. It says, look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Look, you can be cleansed of that stain of sin. I'm going to ask the band to come. After a video, they're going to start playing, and um, then a Christian's going to wrap us up. But notice the remedy of sin. The remedy of sin is not in a detergent. The remedy of the stain of sin is not in the hard work of scrubbing. The remedy for sin is in a person, Jesus Christ. And in that word, look. Now, they found Charles Spurgeon's first sermon. You know that great English preacher, Charles Spurgeon? Really the first megachurch pastor. You may not know this, but back in the 1850s, Spurgeon preached to 6,000 to 10,000 people every Sunday, and he did it with a megaphone. Before sound reinforcement, they found his first sermon. 
It's three minutes. He preached it when he was a teenager, right after he was saved. And even then, this the simplicity of what it takes. No scrubbing, no detergent, no fantastic good works. It's just looking to Jesus and uh, that sin that's been just dogging you, that guilt that's been just overwhelming you and troubling you can be washed as clean as a, as, 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 as a, as a, as a sterile uh, operating room through looking to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon, first sermon, three minutes as he preached as a teenager, only a few months after he was radically converted to Jesus Christ. 